like to welcome Jemima Pierre. She's an associate professor of African American studies at UCLA. Um, uh, Jemima, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's Jemima. Thanks for having me. <laughs> no worries. Uh, so, uh, Jemima, the uh, let's let's just start. I mean, you uh, you. Uh, you, you've written a piece um, about uh, the the sort of ongoing narrative of black despots and white rulers uh, in Haiti. Back up a little bit for us and give us a little bit of history. Uh, you you also uh, discuss the idea of a of a, um, of a of a of a second coup, I guess, or era. Just give us a little bit of of, of basic history on Haiti's. Um, uh, attempts at self-government over the past, well, I mean, I guess we could go years, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. we touch on that and then we'll, we, you know, get into the sort of more modern era. Right. Well, part of it is, um, you know, Haiti is the first um, um, black uh, free republic in, in the world, um, the first successful slave revolt uh, that resulted in the formation of the Haitian Republic um, in 1804. It's actually the second um, uh, independent nation in the Western Hemisphere after the U.S. and so people don't realize that and um, and and after that what you have is this long history of U.S. not recognizing Haiti and France of course charging Haiti in indemnity for um, for the for its loss of land and enslaved Africans right so Haiti had to pay this I, I'm not sure you you all have heard this Haiti had, had to pay this up until the 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 1980s but it was paying France back for. Um, for 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 this revolution that it won against enslavement, so there's that, and then there's a long history. Oh. You'd say that was we're talking 1801 was the end of uh, that. Uh, 1804, yes. 1804. And, yes, yes, and so so you have so you have this long history of this black government, um, which which became independent when slavery was still legal, right? The U.S. you know this is 1804, and then slavery did not end in the U.S. from 1865. In places like South America, like Brazil, slavery did not end to 1888. So you have this long history of this, this you know this this black nation that's been um, at the at, at at on the at the heels, I guess, of of these of of white supremacy um, for a very long time, and so. It was punished for that, and people still. Some people say it's the punished for that. And so you fast forward, for you know, so Haiti has always been. Um, it was surrounded by by the U.S. by the Europeans uh, for a long time. Naval blockades. No one wanted to trade with the nation when it first um, became independent. And then later on in 1915, that was the first occupation when the U.S. Um, military um, came in and occupied Haiti on the pretext of you know protecting its interests. And you know, empty this coffers. The gold was transferred to to New York. You know, and so you have all of this stuff happening. And then this was a 19 year occupation from 1915 to 19 uh, to right before the war, right? So you have that. And during that occupation, you know, um, uh, counter insurgent, you know, insurgents and people who were protesting um, um, were really put down. Thousands were killed. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of the soldiers from, were from the South. So there's a lot of really racist policing happening in Haiti during the occupation. So you fast forward again, you have the, the support of this major dictatorship, you know, the 30-year dictatorship by Duvalier, Baby Doc and Papa Doc Duvalier. And uh, Papa Doc was supported by the U.S. because he was anti-communist, right? So, um, so you had that and you had him develop this dictatorship um, that really lasted and terrorized the population for a very long time. And, and he was deposed in 1987, um, you know, once France and the US, I guess, decided that they no longer needed, needed him. And so 1987 is really the year where we, we really think about the beginnings, you know, of recreating Haitian sovereignty, getting rid of this Duvalier dictatorship. And then, of course, you have, you know, the first democratically elected president, jean bertrand Aristide, which was overwhelmingly supported by the poor people. Which, you know, Haiti, they say the poorest, you know, the, the stereotype Haiti is the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere, which is not true. It's poor because it's completely exploited. It has all the gold, the mineral, minerals and, and oil and, and so on, right? So, so, so there's that. But with Aristide, then you had um, two coup d'etats supported by the CIA, um, one in 1990. Uh, one right at nine months after he came into power, and then one again in 2004 when the U.S. Marines landed in his house, put him on the plane, and flew him to Central Africa. So, so, and after that, then you have then you know uh, what I call the second occupation, and ever since then is what you have 
you know, so the UN, which really uh, 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 allowed this to happen, and, and you have, I've written a longer piece, you know, an academic piece. Uh, I'm an anthropologist, so I write in anthropology journals. And so I've written more about this occupation in the sense that once this coup d'etat happened, it was sanctioned by the UN Security Council, which is run, of course, you know, by the US and France, you know, and, um, and then they decided to deploy a peacekeeping mission because there was so much protest against the coup d'etat. Um, and this peacekeeping mission has been there for a long time. And this is the same peacekeeping mission that brought cholera to Haiti that killed 30,000, you know, and, 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 and that's, you know, behind a lot of violence and so on and so forth. So there's a lot, you know, there's a lot to talk about, you know, it's like 200 years of history, but it is my point about my point with this article was really to talk about just the nonstop imperial meddling in Haiti when it comes to you know people trying to assert their, their sovereignty and I I always we always wonder why it is that Haiti you know requires so much uh, interference and imposition um, regardless of what it's trying to do especially when it's trying to 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 uh, to advocate for itself and for the masses of its people. Well, that is, I mean, I think you know the um, the. The, the the question I think that 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 is just sort of like you know begged to be asked is like is why I mean like why and 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 maybe it's in part that it is it's about resources I mean it is it's stunning the 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 natural resources that exist there uh, that are um, the, uh, of which the wealth the value of that does not seem to reach the people ever. But what is it? I mean, is it um, is it obviously there's a there's a huge part of white supremacy involved in this. But what is it that continually allows for the United States to be meddling in this way and and other countries? To, uh, and other countries. Well, I mean, there you know there you know we we do think white supremacy is part of that definitely. But I do think Haiti has has this you know has been strategically possible. So I you know I was reading a. a if you read like uh, this, I forgot who is by, but the Monroe Doctrine, who this this U.S. Um, military official talking about how significant that area, that location is for U.S. Um, policy. So if you think about, and there's this an island called Mole Saint Nicholas where the, the U.S. government has been trying to get from Haiti for a long time because they want to stage a military. And if you think about, if you think about, you know, the pivot to Asia. The idea that this area provides a way for Southcom, you know, Southern Command, to actually have access to these supposed scary governments in Latin America, Venezuela, and so on and so forth, then you see the need for Haiti. The other thing is there's Guantanamo, which is about to be given back to Cuba. And so, you know, you need a replacement for the Guantanamo base as you know the pivot to, to, to as the pivot to Asia gets gets you know gets established. And so you, then you think about through Haiti, the Panama Canal, then you're in Asia, right? And so so you have to think about all of that, the strategic uh, geopolitical processes. And one of the things that actually kept this dictator in the making, that's what I call him, in power, was the fact that he, for the first time, went against Venezuela with the US, under with Trump. You know, So he recognized Juan Guaido, um, which was something Haiti would have never done, considering Venezuela's close relationship with Haiti historically. And yet, have they uh, called for his resignation? No, the United States, I thought they've kind of supported new elections, but to my knowledge, uh, despite these pro-democracy protests, the United States has not gone for, as far as to call for the resignation um, of Moyes. Oh, no, of course not. Um, well, part of it is there's no way Moyes would be as bold and be still be in power without the consent of the so-called international community. And that is the U.S., that is the U.N., that is especially the OAS. In fact, the OAS has gone out of its way to affirm Moyes needs to stay in power, right? And if they do, if they do, if they get tired of him, if the violence gets too much, and, and that's what we're assuming, in a few months it might be too much for them, um, they might want to replace him. They're, they're probably looking for a replacement, but there's no way that Moyes is in power without the consent of the U.S. Because part of the part of the other the other thing being under occupation is that. There, there are three groups that control U.S. politics. So there's no sovereignty. So there's the core group, and I don't know if you've heard of the core group, which is a group of nations, you know, United States, France, Canada, the U.S., OAS, the EU, you know, Germany, Spain, and Brazil get together all the time and make decisions on Haiti, right? That, the OAS, so they all get together and they decide. 
And so if they affirm, you know, so they were the ones responsible for Moise getting elected to begin with because Moise was deeply popular from the very beginning. So was his predecessor. So the, the predecessor, Michel Matéli, who started the party that he's in, is you know, known for corruption and so on and so forth, but he was actually forced in right, by the Obama administration against the wishes of the people. He, the, the election results were from the first round to the second round were, were changed by the OAS to actually put him into second place. So, so you have to know that these last, the last set of elections, Moise was handpicked by this guy who was actually forced on the people. So people have been protesting this for the longest time. There have been nonstop protests since 2000, 11 since these elections and no one pays attention because until the OAS and the UN and the, uh, and the US say something, nothing will happen. And so to me, that is not sovereignty. To me, but could you, can you speak to the, um, uh, the G, the G9 as it's called and their relationship, um, you know, what impact they have on, uh, the population and their relationship, uh, to Moise? Or are you talking about the gang, the, the G9 gang, right? So, uh, so the thing is, it's, it's very difficult to, the situation in Haiti is so volatile. Things change, alliances change all the time. It actually reminds me of like, you know, the Haitian revolution where alliances change and, you know, the craziness happened and all of a sudden, you know, there was freedom, right? <laughs> so I'm hoping something like that. But the G9 is seen as this gang that's aligned, um, you know, led by this guy named Barbecue that they say is, 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 you know, is a gang that's supported by Moise and that's wreaking havoc um, um, against protesters and so on throughout the city. And I have to say, you know, for the longest time, this has been happening for a long time. Like, so gang, you know, the arming of young, poor, un, un, unemployed young men by the elite, you know, and the elite of Haiti is a bunch of, uh, they're non-black elite, right? They're from, you know, Syrians, Italians, French, there are like eight or nine families who actually run all the businesses in Haiti. They've always armed local gangs to go after each other, to, you know, to, to, to get their political points across. But the gang thing population has gotten, the gang situation has gotten really bad because there's all these arms and you wonder where all these arms are coming from. They're everywhere, right? Um, in addition to US, US providing the, the local police, arms and ammunition. And so this G9, and you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, claim to know much more except for what is, you know, he's being, he's the big boogeyman right now. But I have to say the G9 was actually sanctioned by the UN in the fall where they're saying that he's a peacekeeper. So we have to, we have to think about, we have to think about what that means um, for the G9. But it, there's a lot of violence. A lot of it is state controlled. A lot of the military, a lot of the military equipment that these gangs have come from the government. And a lot of people are saying it's coming straight from the top. But the government is funded and supplied by outsiders, right? Because if Haitians are so poor, they don't build their own arms. They don't have their own tanks, you know, and so on. I, I'm I just to sort of like, um, uh, you know, and and and, and I, I know you're not necessarily an expert on this, but the that dynamic is like, how do we char characterize that? Because it, it feels like those um, it, it is it is a different th that relationship with the with the gangs. I mean, even, call, you know, uh, is sort of a different dynamic than we've seen in other countries in this area. Like it's part sort of. I mean, death squad on some level that is that is uh, th that is deployed um, to 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 uh, tamp down any type of dissent or protest. But it's also part um, uh, drug cartel on some level or at least cartel. I mean, how do you like wh how do you characterize those things? Is there is there anything that is like sort of is there an analogy? Right. There's there's no analogy, but you have to also think about what's going on in Somalia or places like that, where you do have different forces that are being supported and armed um, for proxy wars. Right. And I do think what's going on in Haiti, what we don't remember is when the, the CIA and the U.S. deposed Aristide in 2004, Aristide had dis destroyed the, the army, that disbanded the military. But if, if you look at the WikiLeaks papers, it shows that the US government officials actually reintegrated these rogue military people into the Haitian National Police. So a lot of these so-called gangs are actually former police members who were from a time before who were always already part of the army and the military that we reintegrated. So now there's a major split actually within the police um, in Haiti. You have the people who feel like 
you know, and, and this is when we start seeing the beginnings of, 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 of dictatorship, where the, the, the president himself has his own personal 4,000 member, all he calls them the all black group within the police that he has separated out and, 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 and then start and then putting them against the regular police. And so I have to, you know, part of that is to also say that there's, I want to refrain from saying this is like endemic to Haiti because I do think it's a manufactured crisis. And it's, it's clearly manufactured when you see who's funding what and how it is that certain groups get sanctioned and certain groups don't. But we have to take this, this gang and this, you know, this, the violence that's developing and this fracturing of the Haitian police back to the fact that the dissolved Haitian police was then armed and trained in the DR, brought back to help take down Arisid and then reintegrated into the Haitian police to make seem um, 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 more palatable. And these are the same forces now that are coming back to terrorize the population. You mentioned those uh, WikiLeaks cables, which, which discussed that. They're one of the other big revelations during the Obama administration from WikiLeaks cables was the Obama administration's, um, at the very least, I mean, I, and maybe you have a better sense of how much they were involved in this, but their their issue that they had with the raising of the minimum, of the minimum wage, yes. Yeah, will you just explain that just, I mean, just so that, that folks get a sense of both, A, how much we have, we as in America, United States, have micromanaged um, uh, things in Haiti, but also, um, it, you know, like, it, it, I mean, it's to, to, to prevent people from getting a minimum wage when we're talking about, like, literally cents. I mean, this is, it's just sort of shocking. It was, it, it was, it was like a 30, I have to, I have to remember, it was like a 37, it was a 37 cent up, you know, wage hike, right? Um, so it was like, the, the wage was 24 cents an hour, right? So the US, and then they wanted to bring it up to 37 cents. And the Obama administration fought tooth and nail against that. And I have to say the Obama administration has been, people don't know this, has been the WikiLeaks papers will show you Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, Obama has been horrible to Haiti. Um, and the fact even like for the coup d'etat, you know, with the replacement of the government, where Hillary left, this was during the Arab Spring, she flew from the Middle East, went straight to Haiti and threatened to put the sitting president on a plane out to exile if he didn't agree with the OAS votes, right? So we have to know about how it is that, you know, they wanted the bump, the 37 since bump for Haiti. And, and this is why the old president always said that, you know, we want to be people who live with dignity. People want to work. But the fact that you want to squeeze this group of people the, the suffering for this amount of money tells you how just horrible U.S. policies are and how little regard they have for human beings outside of, of the U.S. And, and inside too, right? If you think about working people. Yes, indeed. All right. Well, um, uh, Jamima, thank you so much for your time today. Um, uh, really appreciate it. We're going to put links to the pieces that you've written um, and, uh, and and folks can get a better sense of, of, of what that um, history has been and what's ongoing. And uh, we're going to take a break and to look forward to what uh, the Biden administration policy has been in these short few weeks. Uh, we're going to be talking to Brian Kincannon from uh, oh, the great. IGDH. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jamima, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me.